Okay, we're now live. Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and it's Thursday, April 25th. It's our last Facebook Live, live in the month of April. Hope everyone's doing well. Weather is getting a little bit better because it's May already. So um, anyway, uh, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, hope everything is going well. So this talk is going to be on GI bleeding. Uh, the reason I picked this topic is because I just finished an update of a talk on GI bleeding that I recorded that Sarah will put up and you'll be able to hear. It's a three-part adventure. I think it'll be at the end of June you'll be able to see it live. But I just wanted to um, talk about a few of the things that I spoke about. There's been a bunch of articles lately on GI bleeding, so I've been rereading those articles, looking for any pearls or pitfalls or anything else. But um, when you think about GI bleeding, whether it's upper GI bleeding, which means stomach, proximal bowel to ligament of trites, or lower GI bleeding beyond the ligament of trites, CT is very good. Even for the classic upper GI bleed, where everyone would agree that the best technique is endoscopy, well, during the COVID era, when people didn't want to do endoscopy, okay, um, well, CT became even more popular and the success of CT was really good. So more and more we are seeing CT for upper GI bleeding or just a patient with GI bleed where you're trying to find the source. Prepping is critical on these studies. Ideally, 1,000 cc's of water. If you can't give water, don't bother, don't give anything. Surely you don't want to give positive contrast. You give positive contrast, you may not see a bleed even when the one is there. You need IV contrast and we need dual phase imaging. The suggestion was to do non-contrast and then arterial, but, and the reason for that mainly was, what if you saw something on the imaging and you're not sure if it's real, sure if it's real or something ingested rather than a bleed. And that's a very good point and can be a challenge. But what we found was by doing arterial and venous, again, I wanted to minimize dose, or I could do non-contrast arterial venous, is that if you have a bleed that's present, you're gonna see it probably on both arterial and venous, but it's gonna change configuration. When things are really actively bleeding, they will change shape between arterial and venous, and that's often a good sign that angio will be helpful. Um, if something stays identical in shape and density between arterial and venous, then it's something that was ingested. It's not a real bleed. A real bleed will change density and will change shape. Usually it gets larger, not smaller. Uh, again, most of the time I could see a bleed arterial and venous, but sometimes I only see it venous, and sometimes I see it better venous, and sometimes I see a better venous and I go back to arterial and say, oh yeah, it's there. Um, again, if you think something is a foreign matter or something ingested, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is compare it. If it's identical, including the same density, it's foreign matter. Bleeding changes shape and changes density. So those two things are gonna be really good. Now, in terms of looking at the images, Obviously axial and coronal and sagittal. Sagittal may be best for looking at the origin of the celiac and the SMA. Coronal best for looking at those vessels as they spread out, but also looking at things more globally where when you're doing axial and scrolling up and down, it's hard to figure out sometimes precisely where you are in the bowel. On the coronal, it's substantially easier but I also like 3D imaging. So one of the things, even if you're not a real 3D person, is use MIP imaging. Remember, when you have bleeding, it's the brightest structure present. If I do scrolling with MIP, particularly in the coronal plane, it's very easy to see something that doesn't belong. And so my recommendation is you always look at the MIP images uh, when you're looking at the vessels or looking for a bleed. It can be very helpful. MIP is particularly good looking at pseudoandrisms, looking at stenosis, looking at vasculitis. But MIP is especially good in GI bleeding, looking for detecting bleed. Sometimes with subtle bleeding, you may only see it on the MIP imaging. I had a case the other day where we had a nice bleed 
and you can see the feeding vessels. So one of the things MIP also helps you is showing you where the vessels are. In this case, it was an ileocolic vessel, but MIP can be very valuable in that regard as well. In terms of delayed imaging, I don't find that helpful. We don't do it. And again, I think with arterial and venous, you don't need the non-contrast. But maybe if you're first getting started in CT or you've had some problems, it's probably not all that big a deal. And get a low dose non-contrast to make certain you're not overcalling things. Now, in terms of bleed, the presence of bleeding is great, but also with CT, we can be very specific why it bled. We can see tumors, think of just tumor as a good example, very bright tumor with active blush present. We're talking about small bowel, of course, but just can bleed in the stomach, small bowel, or in the large bowel, and even in the esophagus. So looking for bleeding. We also want to look for the presence of masses. Remember, carcinoids, just tumors, small bowel, adenocarcinoma, metastasis, all can bleed. So you want to look very carefully and try to recognize, often the patient will not be known to have a tumor, or maybe they have lung cancer and now they have metastasis, a small bowel. We want to make sure we scan low enough. Uh, GI bleeding can often be due to rectal varices, which are particularly large in patients who have cirrhosis. So you want to really take a careful look at that. I think sometimes you have a significant blush and it may be hard to say whether or not the patient's actively bleeding, but you can tell there's actively something going on because there's so much blush present. And rectal varices can be very large and we go into that. You can see rectal varices also um, if you have a tumor compressing vessels, but most of the time I see rectal varices, it relates to portal hypertension. So it's not quite, um, quite a challenge uh, you would be worrying about. So um, in terms of technique, you, again, I told you give water if you can. Uh, IV contrast is critical, five cc's a second for 100 to 120 cc's. Do not do slow injection rates. Do not do 50 cc's of contrast or something like that. You wanna make sure you have enough contrast to detect the presence of bleeding. And also you wanna carefully look for the source of bleeding. Diverticulitis, remember patients with diverticular disease will commonly bleed, but usually it's a one-off and they won't bleed a second time. You wanna look for tumors. You wanna look for vasculitis where MIP imaging will also help. You want to look for um, obstruction. You want to look for patients who've had trauma or things related to trauma as a source of bleeding. So you really want to get a good look and make sure if you see a bleed, you can try to figure out why. Is it tumor? Is it inflammation? Is it ischemia? What else is going on? And I think that's something you can do very, very nicely. Now let me look and see who's around here today. Hassan Kabiri from Norway, hello. And one of our techs, Jay Jemmy, all the way from Glen Boyne, which is not quite down the street, but it seems that way sometimes. Um, and those are really the main features I, want, I wanted to say. Again, when I like doing the bleeding, I like to do reconstructions in, with volume rendering and also do uh, MIP imaging, do it with slabs with about 10 millimeters thick. Again, make sure you look at the sagittal views, look carefully at the um, celiac and SMA and IMA, look at their origin, look for any aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms, look for any complications. Again, be very careful. Um, sometimes these studies are easy, sometimes they're very hard, particularly sometimes hard to determine the cause of bleeding. Is it ischemia? Is it something I need to go in on? Does a patient need surgery? There's lots and lots of causes for bleeding from vasculitis with wall thickening to inflammatory bowel disease to tumors to patients who are immunosuppressed to patients on anticoagulant therapy. So hopefully when you look at the CT, uh, you'll be able to uh, know what's going on. And I see Liliana's lib Liberado, I thought it was Liliana for a second. She's from Spain also, but Librado Rosas is from Spain, and that's a nice place to be from, probably nice weather, and a better view than I have from Hopkins and Judy Fong, who's in the California Bay Area. Sounds like a good place to be as well. 
Anyway, I hope everybody is doing well and hope you found this helpful. But again, go to our uh, Vivecast. It's a three-parter, and I think you'll learn a lot. And with that, have a great day.